Welcome everyone. Um, so the topic changing world of work is very topical at the moment, but a lot of people take the perspective of economics and organisational level, but we wanted to bring it down to individuals, to what it actually means for us as people in our working day life. The thing is for um, Tamsin and I, this is a very interesting time to be a careers consultant because we have found that a lot of the things are actually already happening. There's a lot of trends coming from overseas that we hear about and it's like a wave is sort of coming down hitting New Zealand when it comes to career stuff. So we'll talk more about that. Up on the screen we've got one of our favourite websites. We tell the students if they you know, get tired of studying and at midnight they want a little bit of a change from sort of studying for their exam, they should pop onto this website. It's actually really fun. I would like to be a robot counsellor. <laughs> that would be my pick. Um, you're not actually counselling robots, you're counselling people who actually purchase robots to make sure that they get the one that they really need. Another fun one that I really like is next door, it's a rewilder. So the idea, particularly overseas, is that farms are going to be vertical. So all these car parks, car park buildings that we don't need, they're going to turn them into sort of like market gardens. So in the middle of the city, you'll have a market garden. But they'll need rewilders to turn the, um, to turn sort of like all the roads and all the infrastructure we've got back into nature. So that's what a rewilder does. So if you ever get a chance, just have a pop onto this um, slide. The PowerPoint that we've got will actually be sent to you, so you don't have to sort of like try and memorise, take note of e any of these websites, we'll have it all for you. So this is what we'll cover tonight. So We'll start off by sort of looking at terms that are quite often talked about, like Internet of Things or gig economy, and we'll define them. We'll sort of like get an understanding of what they mean, and then we'll bring it down to that personal level that I was talking about, how we find work, where we work, the types of work environments that we'll have, and throughout and at the end, we'll give some tips about how to thrive. We're trying to take a positive look at this rather than sort of it's doom and gloom, robots are going to take over our jobs and we'll all be unemployed. Um, it is actually really exciting and I genuinely do mean that. But we're going to kick off with a bit of a fun quiz. So what we'd like to do is to get you to sort of let yell out um, uh, some dates that these um, things were first used. First one is email. Any, any guesses for the first use of email? Sorry? 95. No. 94? 1970. Earlier. Earlier. Oh, you're almost oh, very there. Close. Was it 1970 there? I feel like an auctioneer. Can we have. <laughs> going up by one? 1971. 1971. Bingo. Bingo. Okay. It, it How was the World Wide Web. 1952. Oh, no, no. <laughs> this time we're going to have to go up. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. Text message. When was the first text message sent? No, this was later than I thought, actually. No, no. All close, very close to 1991. 1992. So it was actually. Someone called Neil Papworth, he was a test engineer, he sent it on December 3rd um, from his computer to the cell phone of someone called Richard Jarvis, <laughs> if you want details. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Ooh. one final one. Google. Now this was later than I... 98. 98. Yay! Okay, and, and now for a last useless fact. When was go to Google first used on um, a television program? Sorry, no, what, what television program was it used on? Oh, 
Is it to Google? You should Google something. No. 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 Buffy the Vampire Slayer. For those of you who used to love that. Yes. So there you go. Go Buffy. Okay, so there's some, some fun dates. We've got, um, as you'll see here, quite a lot of interesting um, uh, dates over the last few centuries uh, that speak to the whole sort of um, changes in technology from, from the printing press in 1440 to the Bitcoin ATM. I didn't even know a Bitcoin ATM existed uh, in 2013. So a so great deal of um, technical innovations. Heaps as you'll see in the last 50 years. And you'll see from this that um, there's been a massive increase in productivity. Uh, and this, this sort of goes back the last 150 years mostly. Uh, 30 fold increase in productivity has resulted mostly from um, techn technology and other innovations um, uh, that, that have um, uh, been uh, uh, going on in, in our environment. Change is normal. It's a natural and desirable state. We've always experienced it, and as you can see from this, um, we've experienced lots of changes over the, the, the last few decades. Uh, what's different now? It's the speed of the change. Uh, it took 50 years for the landline to be mainstream in America. It took 10 years for the smartphone to be uh, mainstream. Uh, and so it's that speed of change um, uh, that actually can freak a lot of us out. I'm going to go through a little bit of a glossary here because we're going to be using these terms through it, throughout this presentation. So, um, uh, so alternative staffing or non-standard employment, which is, more, is about hiring people with sort of a less traditional uh, way, part-time, on-call, fixed-term, project, task-based, freelancing, those sorts of things. Portfolio career. Uh, this is a sort of a, a relatively new career term, last 10 years perhaps. Um, and it really looks at people who um, may have a, di a variety of different roles. So they could have a mix of part-time jobs, they could have contracts, do a bit of freelancing, they could be self-employed, but they also could be employed by a, a more traditional employer as well. Uh, the gig economy. It is, as it says, a sort of um, uh, people doing gigs. So people having, uh, who have um, those sorts of alternative staffing arrangements. Uh, and that's that trend has begun. There's a prediction uh, that by 2020, 40% of the US workforce will be independent contractors or freelancers. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room uh, are probably encountering that as well. Internet of Things, uh, the IoT. Uh, this is the, the, the high levels of interconnection between our devices. Um, uh, and our devices have got stuff embedded in them that can talk to other devices. Uh, and it'd be, you'd be surprised and somewhat frightened to, um, to know the level of that interconnectivity and also the implications of that interconnectivity. Connect, um, uh, Cyber security is, is a major one there. So navigating this 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 new in, oh sorry I, I forgot the fourth industrial revolution that fusion of technologies and people um, and sort of navigating towards that the, the next industrial revolution um, as you can see each of these would have had massive impacts on the workforces of the time uh, so that first one with um, uh, back in 1784 where uh, steam and water meant that um, things could be mechanized. Uh, 1870, the, the division of labour changed, electricity made a massive difference and mass production really started to ramp up. As recently <coughs> as 1969, that third industrial revolution, um, uh, with the use, increasing use of electronics, IT, and much more automated um, production. Uh, some people think that IT was invented in the 80s, of course, but that was in invented a lot earlier than that. And then the fourth industrial revolution, some people say that that's already here, but others say we, we, we're not quite there yet. So that's why that's got a, a question mark, but they do talk about the fourth industrial revolution being that fusion of technology and people. And um, I guess that can be slightly frightening in that um, uh, are doctors and IBM's Watson going to be the people who actually diagnose you rather than you just relying on doctors? 
Are you going to have nanotech stuff injected into you to actually help solve problems? Um, so t tiny little robots going around in your bloodstream. Um, uh, it, but healing you, so that's got to be a good thing. Um, uh, the printing of, um, uh, of limbs that might be done in someone's garage. Uh, rather than having having to go and and, and go through a, a great rigmarole, so so as you can see, there's this, there's the implications for the way that, that we work and the way that we live of this fourth industrial revolution are also really significant. And this is actually going to impact a great deal on business models. Uh, you'll see from from this slide that th there's already stuff um, that's impacting business models. Uh, some of which um, uh, we're going to talk about tonight, some of which we're not going to uh, because that would be a, a day seminar rather than a, an hour seminar if we did. Uh, but you see that the 2015 to 2017, um, some, some stuff ca coming through there that's, that's ha having a significant impact already. Internet of Things, uh, lo the longevity and ageing societies, uh, advanced manufacturing and, and um, 3D pr printing. Um, uh, and, and these are going to actually really sig significantly impact on things. In the future, robotics, autonomous transport, support, artificial intelligence. Now, of course, these are being used now, but they, the, the, there's a sense that they're not, not making a massive impact on us at the moment, but they have the potential to make an incredible impact of, on us in the future. I was really interested when I looked at the Internet of Things and I started thinking about it. Um, on my smartphone, I can turn my lights on at home. I can control my vacuum cleaner. I hate vacuuming, so I've got a robot vacuum cleaner. And I control my stereo as well. So there's just so many things that we can already do. So the Internet of Things, for me, because I'm a techie geek, is really exciting. I can't wait for the next thing that I'll get. I was really excited when I got my first robot. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, uh, technical, e technical experts um, uh, are predicting all sorts of really, really significant things that are going to affect um, uh, some, that, that, that there will be really significant tipping points. And things like um, clothes connected to the internet. Uh, why might you have that? Well, um, you might have that because uh, you live by yourself and you may have a medical condition that you need to be monitored and those clothes could actually be uh, monitoring your medical condition. Um, things like driverless cars, thing, uh, AI machines being on boards of directors. Uh, I find that a little bit freaky, thinking of um, uh, an artificial <coughs> intelligence choosing um, the, the way that a business is going to go. But these all have the potential to really significantly affect jobs and affect the way that you're going to work in the future. Jobs and skills, they are changing significantly. And there's lots of doom and gloom out there about the way that um, uh, the change, changes that are happening now uh, can, could actually be bad for us. This is actually a more optimistic viewpoint that one of the dominant truths of the 21st century is that almost anything that you can imagine being done by a machine will be done by, by a machine. But that's great because what that leaves us is the creative space. Uh, there is significant made, uh, labour market disruption, but we talked about there being disruption um, uh, as being uh, jobs displaced, but also jobs created. Uh, and you'll see that um, careers in 2030, that link will be on this um, PowerPoint presentation that you get so you can have a play around with that. Uh, and so there will be an awful lot of jobs uh, that um, uh, have been created in the last 10 years, the last 20 years. Uh, we see students who come in and they, they ask us about a particular role uh, and w we thought it was that we'd, we'd only just heard about it and sometimes we actually have to do some frenetic research because they, they, they may even be ahead of us. Um, so, um, so yeah, so the labour markets are being disrupted, but there's, um, but there's also an awful lot of um, jobs and job families um, uh, that are on the increase, along with those jobs that are going into the, into the decline. Um, so, um, so looking at those, those job families, you'll see that um, things that use the, um, uh, the intellectual skills, those creative skills, architecture, engineering, uh, the computer and mathematical uh, jobs, management jobs, business and finance jobs, 
Uh, those sorts of jobs are, are on the up. Whereas some of those jobs which have a lot more, um, I guess, repetitive nature to them, uh, so things, things like office and administrative, uh, uh, are being um, are what the ones that are more likely to be on the decline at the moment. Uh, manufacturing is another construction, uh, all possible areas um, uh, or real areas of decline. The quote that started the section sort of talked about creativity, and it's um, this was these were uh, done by um, interviews with employers around the world. Uh, this comes out of the Future of Jobs report from the World Economic Forum. Uh, and um, they see significant changes from um, uh, 2015 to 2020 uh, in what they, the, the skills that they are going to be looking for in their employees. Uh, and so that, that move to, um, uh, to utilising skills like creativity, like critical thinking, um, is, is going to be significant. And you'll see that all of those skills in 2020 are non-technical. You'll also see that there can, can be aspects of them done, um, like something like complex problem solving. A computer can help with that, certainly, but it, can, it, can, it often can't do the complex so problem solving by itself. Critical thinking, again, uh, you can get a computer and an artificial intelligence to, to have some thoughts of its own using algorithms, but it can't actually do it for itself. It, it, we, we need people to, um, to do these. Uh, creativity, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. People management, I have my suspicions that there's a fair number of people who wouldn't be that entranced by the thought of uh, having a manager who was a robot. And so I think that there's always going to be, well, can you imagine it? Yeah, um, even one that looks like a person? I still think that, there, I think there would be resistance anyway. Um, so, um, so yes, yeah, so, so certainly technology will be able to uh, enhance some of these, but will it be able to do it by itself? Can I just uh, probably say not. Um, one role that a lot of people talk about, accountant, we're in the business school, so let's talk about accountants. There's a website that are out there that says that accountants, you know, 95% likelihood that that won't exist as a career in about 10 years. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that those jobs will still exist, they will just change. So it's the skills that we've been talking about. So the computer will spit out all the numbers, they'll be able to do a 100% audit rather than a sampling, but then they need the person to translate what they, those numbers mean for the client. So that means that for, in say, the accounting profession, those complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity will become even more important. It's those people skills that they will need. And if you think of them as interpreters, they interpret the numbers for the client. So there's a lot of jobs that won't disappear, they will just change. It, is, it was actually really interesting because we had someone from a, 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 a seriously high level in a, um, a, a second tier accounting firm, wasn't it, a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. Mm. Uh, and he said he'd been talking to his people within that accountancy firm already about the changes. Uh, and someone came to him one day and said, uh, I've heard on the radio this morning that there are only going to be three accountants in New Zealand uh, in five years. <laughs> uh, and he said, don't worry, that's not going to happen. But he said, this, what have I been telling you? We're going to have to change the way that we do things. And so organisations are changing the way, the, 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 the nature of the work that they are getting people to do. I think to Toyota is a good example. So we think of them as a car manufacturing firm, um, whereas mm. they actually are starting to see themselves as a sales and marketing firm. Mm. Which is quite interesting. Yeah, Lewis Road Creamery. Um, it's a mar marketing firm, not a manufacturing firm. So it's a, a, again, it, it sort of goes back to those different business models too, doesn't it? So the whole creativity and humanity is the thing that we really bring to, um, to our roles, to our jobs. Automation's going to change the nature of our jobs, uh, but often what automation is going to change is the, um, is the repetitive, the, um, the manual dare I say, the boring parts of our roles, um, uh, the, the, the tasks that, um, uh, that can be duplicated, that can be done through, um, through algorithms and that sort of thing. Uh, 
But automation and, um, and intelligence is going to help us to focus our attention on what matters most, and that's creating new forms of value. Uh, it's, it's, it's allowing our creativity to flourish. Uh, and you're going to talk a little bit more about ways to do that in, in, in the, the next section or in a couple of sections from now. Um, and so we're going to actually have to really sort of f focus on the humanity that we bring to the workplace. And we're going to have to think about how can we actually use those creative skills? How can we develop those creative skills if we don't think that we have those, those skills? Um, how, how are we going to be interacting with, um, with people? So how we can we use our empathy, our imagination, uh, our vulnerability to actually enhance what we do in the workplace? Uh, uh, and so it's, it's going to be really, really um, uh, different time. Uh, but actually one of the great things is that computers will be able to, that information overload that we're going to, we're, that we're already getting probably from all our devices and things, the, the computers and, and technology will be able to deal with that and allow us to do what we're best at doing, um, uh, being human beings really. So I'm now going to hand over to Peter. Uh, who's going to be talking about a variety of other changes. So in terms of job searching, so how are we going to find jobs in the future? It's actually already happening, some of the changes that we've noticed. So just looking at this, I don't know how well you can see it, but in the pre-1990s, it was newspapers. Uh, we looked for jobs in newspapers, but we also used networks as well. Vacancy signs and shop windows. Um, and then in 1995, Career Builder was launched. And today, employers actually search for candidates and they can look at your social media. We can use social media ourselves to find jobs and employers can look at social media to find us. So while we're busy looking for work, you can actually have a situation where recruiters are sort of like investigating us as well. It's almost Big Brother is watching you, almost. Um, LinkedIn has developed an economic, you know, I won't read that one. <laughs> okay, that's enough of that. But one of the important things too is that things like um, uh, networking, it might, have, might be the sort of the, there's the old fashioned networking, but there is the enhanced um, uh, capability that technology gives you to network, isn't there? So the thing about networking and the internet is it's actually transformed the way that how we search, how we apply for jobs, how we network. So before it was face to face. Um, but now it's online. We can network um, using Facebook, but typically we use LinkedIn these days. So that saying about it's not what you know, it's who you know, that's more important now than ever before. It is really important. So in recent years, um, employers have been using LinkedIn, social media, to find candidates. This particular example, it's just got one column that I thought was interesting, was called Source. And they're doing this manually. They're browsing the internet to find people. Um, they also found some people from a job bank and from a job posting board. But the scary thing is, even though I did say we were trying to be positive, <laughs> is there's something called web scraping. So that's an automatic process where they can tell these bots to go onto the internet and look for certain things. So say they wanted to look for a software developer. So they could tell this bot to just basically look through so much data on the internet, go onto a software developer forum where all they, they hang out and chat to each other. This little bot goes onto the forum, collects the name of the software developer, the area of specialty, where they work, their email address, their telephone. I actually hadn't thought about it, but when I was researching this, universities, we've got our staff profiles, our faculty pages are public. So if someone wanted to find um, someone from a university, say an academic, all they have to do is just get a bot to go out, trawl through all the university pages and find names, phone numbers, areas of specialty, email addresses. I started to get a little bit freaked out by all that. <laughs> I am the introvert in the room though. <laughs> and the other thing is phone numbers. So you know how social media wants you to put your phone number um, so that then if something happens they can contact you on your phone? Nah, they really want to do that because then people can search for you using phone number. 
So I'm sort of slightly going off on a track here. Um, but I actually use social media in two different ways. So I have two names. So I use my work name for things like LinkedIn, but I use another name for my private social media. But if I use my <laughs> phone number to um, both, they'll be able to figure out who I am. So that's a little bit scary. So I'm not gonna be putting my phone number anywhere in the future. So anyway, um, so web scraping, it is legal in case at you're wondering, moment. at the moment. They are looking at the legality of it because there is so much information they can find out, all automated. So it doesn't require any effort. Um, and then what happens is applicant tracking systems. So you will have encountered these already. If you decide you'd like to work for a particular organization, you might sign up um, on their profile, put in your information, and then if a job comes up, they'll have a look at the system, see if anyone matches what they're looking for. But it can also be when you apply online, you'll submit your CV, the ATS will take all the details, pop it into the computer system, it will um, look for keywords. The computer will decide whether you are a match for the role or not. The computer could be the one that rejects you based on your score. Or the computer could be the one that sends you um, an invitation to do psychometric test or a video interview. So it can take a while down the process before a person is actually involved. And we know this happens um, because some of our students say that when they put their application in online during, say, March Madness, when there's a lot of uh, recruitment going on, sometimes within three to five minutes they get their rejection. Yeah. And sometimes they're putting that, that application in. I had one who put the application in at 3.30 in the morning. I said, what? She said, yeah, I was rejected by 3.40. So um, I doubt that anyone from the Big Four was actually sitting up waiting for the, her application to come in. So it, it, it must have been a bot that, um, that rejected her, yeah. So this just all happens automatically. Um, they can also, so you don't put your social media into mm. your CV or into the profile, the ATS can actually go and search social media and it can link any of your um, social media like put your URL into your profile and it can even take more information from say your LinkedIn and pop it into their system um, and we don't realize all of this is happening <laughs> but um, unless you're a privacy if, unless you're worried about privacy um, it can not necessarily privacy yeah privacy <laughs> not okay let's face it um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing but for you, it does mean that you need to be very careful about your social media and your social media brand and make sure that that's spot on. It means that when you put in an application, you need to match keywords. So the ATS will be searching for certain keywords like people skills. So you need to check the job ad, the job description, their website and see what you, words they use and make sure those words are in your application. And people skills and interpersonal skills are the same thing. But if you use people skills, and they've used interpersonal, um, and even sort of like abbreviations and things. So search engine optimization, use the words that they use, both in say your application and on your social media as well. And then the other thing is um, when it comes to sort of like doing a CV, you don't wanna use tables, borders, boxes, headers, footers, because sometimes the ATS can just not read what's in them and it can just come up as blank. Um, if you do sort of like you think that the type of application you're putting in, chances are it'll be looked at by an ATS, um, then just Google it uh, because how to do a friendly, ATS friendly CV is all over the internet. Um, lots of tips. It's happening a lot overseas, it is happening in New Zealand, but it tends to be the larger organisations. Mm -hmm. But as this becomes more cost effective, it saves organisations time, administration, and what it does is it frees up the people in the organisation to do the people stuff that Tamsin was talking about. The connections, uh, making contact with people. Mm -hmm. We attended a um, one day seminar last week and one recruiter was talking about how his team are always online. They use LinkedIn excessively, extensively and excessively. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they 
want to um, be connected. They want you to connect with them and connect with other people in the firm. It's those personal connections that are really important. They're not keen on scattergun applications where they can see someone is just applying to every job that seems to be going on their firm. They want them to be targeted um, and really matched and they want you to reach out and talk to them. You said that they reward initiative in that, uh, in, in that way too. So if you contact them in a slightly different way, then they, um, they may reward that initiative by contacting you back. Yeah. The other thing we're noticing because of this partly is the focus on online application firm forms. So some firms aren't doing a cover letter anymore. They just want you to submit an application form and a CV. There's one organisation during the re graduate recruitment round, which here at the university a lot of firms recruit in March, one organisation had just an application form, no CV or anything. One recruiter from one of the banks, she was saying that she thought the CV would pretty much die in the next few years um, and it would be replaced by something like LinkedIn. So they might just want application form, your LinkedIn URL, no CV, no cover letter. So it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. And in those online applications, sometimes they'll ask quite weird or unusual questions that you think that they are, but they actually do matter. They may use that as a screening tool. So you may not even get to the next stage because of those application questions. So you need to treat them with just as much importance as if they, um, uh, if they even if they ask for a CV and a cover letter, because they may not look at your CV and your cover letter if you haven't answered those questions in a way that engages and interests them. So these are things we're seeing sort of are coming through, but they seem to be gaining momentum. Another thing that they've been talking a lot about overseas is blind applications and this has come through to New Zealand now as well. And they take away sort of identifiable information. So your name, anything that identifies your gender, your ethnicity, they even can remove the school that you went to. So this is to remove what's called unconscious bias, which in our sort of like field is sort of like a big buzzword at the moment, um, unconscious bias. The other thing we're noticing, um, psychometric testing pretty much has stayed the same for a very long time. Sort of, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, they went from paper to um, online, but that was about the only difference. They seem to be pretty much the same. Um, but they are changing just lately, and gamification is a particular change that is using technology to its utmost. I think we've got time, haven't we? So, Gamification, it's like playing an online computer game. So people like me would love it. <laughs>was just that bit for a minute um, so one of the things that's different is you know how when you do some people do a jigsaw puzzle they'll look at the piece they'll look at sort of the puzzle and they'll look and then they'll just put it straight in the right sp spot and then other people will take a piece and they'll just move it all around so with this um, system they can actually track all your movements around the screen I think that's <laughs> really clever <laughs> really clever
So for some people that would be really scary and other people looks like a lot of fun. Um, you don't have to be a pro gamer, it's sort of like Candy Crush type level, uh, Angry Birds. Um, so that looks like fun and it was introduced into New Zealand a couple of years ago, two, years ago, I think, yes. two three years ago yeah. um, and like one or two firms in terms of the grad graduate recruitment space were using it and more and more are starting to do it. Um, so that is definitely a growing trend. Another one is video interviews that was introduced about four or five years in the graduate recruitment space by one of the big four and now pretty much everyone is doing it. That one was like a snowball just downhill, it was mm. yeah, really quick uptake of that. So a video interview is where you are sent a link, you are asked to record answers to say five questions, um, you do it on, with your computer, there is no interviewer there or behind you know sort of the camera so it's very sort of like it feels a bit weird and you're trying to sort of like answer these questions yeah some people are nodding mm -hmm. it's it's a bit disconcerting um, just speaking to the camera and then you um, send it off and you don't know who's going to look at it how many people are going to look at it it's a little bit freaky and then video cv it might be that some people do one uh, a video cv to sort of basically um, show their personality. So they might take a recruiter through their CV and it's just as a um, compliment to their paper CV. But in some cases, employers might ask you to do a video CV. So it's a bit different from a video interview in that they might ask you to just um, talk for a couple of minutes about this topic or take us through your CV in a video. So they are using technology more and more and they're coming up with ever creative ways to test people. There's another thing we've noticed, and it sort of relates to this. It's about job seekers. So um, the talk that we went to last week, the speaker was talking about something that we've noticed as well, and that's from a job seeker per, um, perspective. Job seekers are starting to look for different things. So he joined his organisation in 2011, and he said until 2014, hires were really interested in stability. Then since 2015, they've been actually focusing on other things. They've been asking about things such as career progression, the physical work environment, which I'll talk about later, um, flexible working, so whether they can work from home, whether they can work part-time, whether they can do project work, um, which is what Tamsin is going to talk about now. So, alternative forms of employment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, there's, there's going to be a great deal more of a contingent workforce. There's going to be a lot more people who are going to have much more unusual uh, arrangements with, um, with their particular organisations. Uh, so one thing that, um, uh, in Peter and I discussing this, we've actually realised is that this, that this may, may already be more prevalent. So what we'd like you to do is to actually think about your family and friends. Think about how many of them have got traditional employment as a, a, like a permanent full-time employee, um, or how many of them have got uh, more alternative employment. Um, so I'd just li like you to just turn to the person next to you and have a, a bit of a discussion on this. <laughs> Okay, so I'd, I'd just like to get a, a few people to give a little bit of feedback on this. Um, so, th these two people in the front here, what, what was your percentage for, say, your family and friends who were in more traditional employment versus more, perhaps, um, uh, uh, less traditional employment? I think from the, the conversations that we had, we figured out that the vast majority is traditional. Okay, Although yeah. the hours may vary. Right, okay. My so so your family's a bit more alternative, <laughs> right? Yep, okay. yep. Uh, the people in, in the front to here? You? Actually, it was quite interesting because you had that bit about the, um, the different types of careers now that are sort of up or coming down or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was quite interesting because my, my son just started working this year. He just graduated just, you know, last week. And he's at, um, 
intellectual property engineers at Fisher and Paykel Healthcare. And um, so that and that was a degree in engineering mechatronics. So I mean, you know, at first we were really scared what he was doing because it was so new and everything when he first you know, started, it was like not many people doing it. And so now we sort of think, oh, you know, he chose the right thing to do. <laughs> yeah. And is, is he an employee or is he a project worker or? Uh, uh, so, so he, yeah, he, he, he probably, I think it's eight to four thirty. Okay, so more of an yeah. employee type yeah. arrangement. Yeah, but yeah. it's only just started, so I right. guess he's got yep. to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Any, it, did anyone else discuss um, uh, where that they had more people they knew who were alternative forms of employment? Yes, so some people down the back, yeah? Uh, regarding alternatives, like the, the screen before, it was mentioned there regarding movies. So a lot of people actually joined for a project and then they just yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. But I recently also read in the news that a lot of jobs were lost in Hollywood when using basic movies. Yep. Like 20 million worth of jobs were lost. But that again depends on the nature of the job that you're doing. Like permanent, uh, some jobs are that like you need a permanent person right there so that what you know at least you want to do. And then there's concrete roles uh, basically. If you gain some experience, become a consultant, then you can actually go for a contract role. So I think the nature of the job actually plays into, comes into play when you this well. Yeah, and I think certainly the nature of the job can, can influence that. I guess one of the, thing, the interesting things is that uh, some organisations are now deliberately sort of having their, their more standard employees there, uh, but also they're choosing to, to, to change down around their workforce a lot more through having more people with that alternative forms of employment. Yeah. yeah. Even the, the on-call job, sometimes they actually get their permanent employees to do it, yep. they just pay them a different rate. Or they actually get a consultant to do it in case they are not enough permanent employees. Mm -hmm. That is again the defence. Which actually brings me nicely on to um, uh, the, uh, the, the benefits um, what about and you? not. Uh, sorry, what about me? What about oh, you? actually, what about me? Um, most of my family are not alter uh, are alternative. I'm one of the boring ones um, who actually have um, uh, a nine-to-five, five-day-a-week job. Uh, I've got um, authors in the family, self-employed, uh, self-employed and working, uh, so portfolio career. Uh, yeah, quite quite a quite a wide variety. Uh, but yes, I'm 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 really the um the only one who's actually got a standard job in my wider uh, immediate family. Yeah, and, and you? I'm, I'm sort of similar. Um, in terms of my friends, I've got two friends I think who have traditional employment. The rest are all alternative. So it's a mix of it's some of them. Self-employed, really, uh, non-traditional. Mm -hmm. I mean, self-employed, that's pretty traditional. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it could be considered uh, both, depending on, on, on the combination. I guess with um, uh, people often used to be self-employed or not, uh, perhaps more tr non-traditional is the portfolio worker who might be self-employed two days a week, employed a in a, a corporation two days a week and, um, and doing something uh, like contracting or, or something like that uh, a day a week. So I guess perhaps that, perhaps the f that portfolio type career is, is pr perhaps a little bit more alternative. So a lot of my friends are part-time and also self-employed. They do both. Um, most of them would be that mix. Uh, and then the others would be part-time for various reasons, family responsibilities or because they're trying to develop a, a, their own career self-employed, but they have to sort of like work part-time while they're working on it. Hmm. And some people, that part-time choice may be because they want a steady income in one of their roles. And, uh, and whereas sometimes uh, a self-employed or contracting may not be uh, quite so reliable as far as income goes. So moving right along, um, thinking about the, um, uh, the benefits. Uh, benefits for employers definitely can be more flexibility. Uh, they can adapt more to the changes in market conditions and, and their labour requirements when things sort of go up and down. Uh, there's the potential for lower labour costs, but that's the, the, just the potential. Uh, there are also sort of labour regulations and things like that, uh, 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 redundancy packages, those sorts of things can be avoided in some of those forms of employment. Uh, for employees, you can, you can actually have a lot more flexibility. You can choose who to work for and when to work. Uh, so you have a much higher, higher flexibility. 
there's a potential for higher income for employees because um, uh, you, as a contractor you often get paid uh, a higher hourly rate. Sometimes as a part-time uh, person you get paid a highly hour, hour, higher hourly rate. I know that I've said to someone when they wanted me to come in for um, uh, for one day a week, I said, well, no, actually, I can't, I can't afford to go below this certain amount because that's, that's the certain amount I don't go below. Uh, and they said, oh, oh, okay. But they paid that because they, because they, um, they needed slash wanted me. So, um, so yeah, so that, that's, there's the potential for that. It's also some risks, though, uh, for employers that um, uh, if they've got a high level of people who have the, the sort of less standard employment, uh, if the labour market gets really tight, uh, finding qualified staff can become really difficult. And we see that in New Zealand now, um, with some employers really struggling to get skilled people. Uh, and so they may have to pay more for them. There's also the potential for turnover to be a lot higher because of that, um, that lack of certainty of employment. There's also less of an emotional contract um, uh, for a lot of people with the employer uh, if they're not uh, in an employer-employee relationship. Uh, for employees, well, one of the downsides is the, the, the lack of um, a job security. Uh, and um, one of the problems, of course, uh, is that uh, when, when the labour market gets really tight, you may struggle to get a job, so you may, um, uh, you may struggle to have an income at all. Um, and you can also miss out on um, uh, benefits, uh, things like superannuation, you know, KiwiSaver, those sorts of things. Uh, can be impacted upon. So it can have some significant effects, effects downstream as well. Uh, and the sort of career implications of this, well, um, the peop different people have different career anchors. So if security and stability, for example, was a really important career anchor for you, then you may struggle quite a lot uh, being in a, an a environment where, where you're a freelancer and you don't have that security and that stability. Um, and so, so, so that's, that's sort of sub, sub, something that could affect the way that you choose uh, to be employed as well. Uh, whereas as if other, um, other things uh, like, say, pure challenge are important to you, uh, then you might get a lot of uh, a buzz, a lot of adrenaline about being on different projects that, um, that excite you, you. And you might find the sort of the, the whole going to work for the same employer all the time a little bit uh, more boring. So thinking about your career in anchors may impact on, um, uh, on the sorts of uh, employment that you might choose. One thing I would like to say about the risks though too is that the risk is greater for people who are low skilled because they're less likely, say, in an economic downturn, to be able to mm. find the number of jobs they need to make a full-time income. Or if they live in rural areas as well, uh, there's sort of a bit of a rural city divide, sort of like Wellington and Auckland and the rest of New Zealand. Um, and all of that can impact on some of the risks to this for employees. So basically in the 1960s, some <laughs> bright person invented open plan offices. Um, so as an introvert you can imagine that has gone down really well with me <laughs> and with the rest of us. Uh, and then someone else in 1968 designed the cubicle office. Um, and then if we just kind of like fast forward to round about now, so 2015, Big organisations like Apple, BBC, Google, We've, most of us will have seen pictures of what the Google offices look like. Um, they decided that collaborative office design was really important. That we're social people, that rather than having a desk and having formal meetings, designing offices so that there's a collaborative space, you're walking along the corridor, you bump into someone, you have an informal chat, can be perhaps even more effective than all this formal stuff. So that happened in the f um, has happened around about now. Um, and the thing that has actually made this happen is communication. It's had a big impact. So particularly laptops and cell phones, it means you can work anywhere, which may or may not be a good thing. Um, if you sort of like one of your career anchors is work-life balance, maybe not so good um, because you could be on the beach and your cell phone rings. Uh, but 
it's communication that has allowed this to happen. And some companies are now starting to take advantage of, it, of that. So an example in Auckland is Smiles Farm. So the new Vodafone building, or they retrofitted it. So everything in the building is enabled by smartphone, wireless enabled, voice and video aware, and also incorporates virtual reality. Yeah, you can see, I'm smiling. <laughs> um, so you can work anywhere in the building. You can work in a cafe. So we did actually have a, um, a presentation where someone f uh, from Vodafone spoke, but he was in a cafe, um, came up, and he was talking to our students in the seminar room at the cafe using technology. It was cool. Um, so that's communication. It's allowed all of this to happen. Thank you. But... 1987, cubicle, a lot of us sort of like that 1987 side, there's a lot of offices that still look like that. Unfortunately, not so many that look like this. Um, but they're happening. So particularly newer buildings, um, so like the ones that are popping up in Winyard Quarter, for example, the larger organisations that are shifting down there are they're not just doing open plan, they're incorporating other aspects of the design. You can do really simple things. So I was talking about hallway meetings. You widen the hallways so it's possible for people to have a hallway meeting. You have um, whiteboards in public places. For me, um, that just totally freaks me out. <laughs> and I always thought open plan, no way. And then I started sort of like seeing the newer designs and how they incorporate different spaces. So you might sit at a desk like that, open plan, um, hot desking, you can move around the whole building in some cases. They don't insist that you sit at your desk. Um, for these sorts of organisations, you know, sort of like, it's not that you have to be at your desk. Some organisations think to be working, you've got to be sitting there nine to five, nine to whatever. Uh, and if you're not at your desk, you're not working. And there are some companies still like that, but more and more they're switching this way. You've got your cell phone, you can work anywhere in the building or the cafe. And it means you've got a choice of spaces if you're hot desking. So I used to hot desk and it meant that I had to sit at the desk of someone who wasn't actually there. It was their desk, I would just camp out. That's not real hot desking. This is where you could sit there one day. You could sit in that little sort of like curved area one day. You could go down to the cafe another day. Um, but you need different spaces. So it's not all about sort of like the op open plan and the whole office thing. You need <coughs> places for privacy for people to focus on their work where they can contemplate, restore, relax. Um, that one there where it's all whiteboard that really excites me. Tamsin just no, so didn't much, no. get it. Um, but I just love that idea. That's where you would find me. If not, I would be there. Um, so this is all really cool. And it's that communication, the technology that's allowing it to happen. Um, we do a workshop with our students and we get them to split themselves into introvert and extrovert. And interestingly, they all want all of this. They want that. They want an office building sort of like with a slide, one of them said. So you could go down the slide to get to the next floor. They want coffee. But the introverts and the extroverts want the open plan as well. And they want the private spaces. So they all want the same things. It's just the balance that differs. That's all. Which we thought was really interesting too. Yeah. And it's interesting that more and more organisations are recognising that people are different. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, that's, that's a sort of an, an important thing. But also important when you're going out into the workforce to work out what's the sort of thing that you are interested in, what, where, how, how and where you want to work. Because if the, the workplace freaks you out, uh, even if you're loving the work that you're doing, you may actually find that the environment is, is, is actually poisoning your brain. So it's, 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 it's really important to sort of consider that uh, when you're making choices. And I guess one question is, okay, so people can work at home, why put in all this effort and money into these office spaces? But we're actually social animals. We actually do like to be around other people. There's actually chemical reactions that happen when you're around other people. So that's why people work in cafes, even when they're just sitting there on their own. 
um, it actually makes them feel better. So that's why organisations are putting the effort into this. People do actually want to go to work. It's just that balance. Um, so this is our final slide. So it's strategies to thrive. And we've been talking about it as we've been going on. So networking, social media, thinking about what your personal brand in are all really important. But so is personal resilience. So you need to know your personality, what you can cope with, what sort of degree of stress you can cope with. Do you need stability in your workplace? Are you okay with sort of like freedom? The other thing is financial resilience. There could be periods where you actually have to upskill, retrain. So you might not be working or you might have been made redundant. You're in between projects. So you need that financial resilience to be able to cope during those periods, personal resilience as well. And then of course, on top of all of this, you're saving for retirement. <laughs> and some people, you know, some people say, oh, superannuation won't, yeah, we won't go down there. <laughs> um, so personal awareness, knowing what you're worth, knowing what your values are, what's important to you in a workplace, what sort of work style and environment you will thrive in. So just knowing that about yourself, and then connected with knowing what you're worth is that negotiating, negotiating skills. You need to actually be able to ask an employer for more money. Um, and that's something New Zealanders in particular are very bad at. But you need to know sort of what you're worth and be prepared to go and ask and negotiate on your own behalf. And also involved in that too is, uh, is thinking about what is important to you? What, what are your values? Because then you, you, it may be that you're actually able to sacrifice some money for other aspects of, um, of what you want in your working arrangement. So that self-awareness is incredibly important as well. That's partly why portfolio career has been on the rise. So some people have deliberately downsized job-wise, career-wise, or they've picked up portfolio careers because they want to be able to explore other ways of working, they want to have more time with their families. Um, portfolio careers are becoming more, more popular than they used to be. When it comes to skills, so like when we're talking to our students, they're sort of worrying about if I study this, what job will I get? And we can, can give them direction about that, but a lot of the time we tell them to look at what skills you're gaining from that degree. But some employers are hiring because you've got a degree, which means you've got a brain and you've got motivation. And they will actually teach you what you need to know. And they're more interested in transferable skills like critical thinking, communication, people skills, because they can't teach you that. And also enthusiasm to work for them, to work in that particular job and industry. They can't inject you with enthusiasm. <laughs> so these are the things that are really important. Embracing technology and just lifelong learning. So one big thing about this is we will just always be learning. It's not going to stop. And it's, it's, it's ironic because a lot of our students, when they, when they finish their, um, their bachelor's degree, come to say, yeah, yes, that's it, that's me done for, you know, for life. No more qualifications, no more study. And then a couple of years later, hi. <laughs> um, uh, so, so that whole lifelong learning. And also organisations are recognising that. The m most successful organisations are ones that actually have a, a strong level of professional and personal development uh, as part of their interaction with their, um, their employees. Uh, it's another thing that's, that's interesting about the whole um, uh, what way that, that sort of work is going is that, that they, if you are actually um, a freelancer or something like that, you're going to have to embrace that lifelong learning for yourself. So your, your employer may not be doing the professional development. You may be having to think for yourself, what, how do I get to the next stage? What's important for me to, to, to do these particular roles to gain those skills? Um, so hopefully that was a optimistic look at the future of work uh, and gave you some tips. We do have some further information here. As I said, we will send you out the PowerPoint, um, but this has got links to other information that we found interesting, so we hope you do too. Um, and a lot of the sort of like the images that we've used, um, you'll be able to link to sort of like some of the articles that we got them from. Has anyone got any questions? Yep. Uh, in terms of virtual offices, I'm very interested in that concept because I hear a lot of companies don't 
own building, so they don't actually work in a building, and people only work from home. So the networked workforce, yeah, essentially? So what are some of the constraints there? Because that seems like a really interesting concept, because that would help out a lot of people, and at the same time, save organisations a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And also save infrastructure and things like yeah. that, and getting people to and from work, yeah. So what's, what's the future like in that area? Is that something which is in the immediate future? Can, we, can you see a lot of big organisations? I know a lot of small organisations do it, but some of the bigger ones, can they actually move to that model? Interestingly, one of the reasons we didn't put so much focus on that was because the research that um, uh, I've done recently on that is that Organisations are thinking about it a lot, but not moving so much. I think there's the social aspect of it as part of it. Uh, and certainly the, the, the organisations are, are using the networked capability in a variety of different ways. You know, international project teams, that sort of stuff. But, um, but I think that um, it's, it hasn't changed as fast as we might have thought. And there's not, there doesn't seem to be a massive amount of buy-in for larger organisations at the moment. Uh, I think there's a trust aspect as well. Uh, and I think that, that uh, perhaps as that, that sort of that knowledge environment uh, becomes more prevalent and people are sort of trusted more, then that might change. But even so, there's again, it's that whole social aspect of it, isn't it? Yeah. Social aspect. Um, and I think it will depend very much on industries. So you can see that happening more, say, in the IT industry uh, than in some others. Um, and what might happen is, yep, the head office will get smaller and they might have satellite offices so they can still have the social aspect where people will still come together but when someone is in a totally different country then, yep, they'll network in. So it'll be um, a mix. I think it's interesting when, when, you, talk, look, when, when you think of both that concept, it, it's more, it sounds like a cost-saving concept that you're going to save on rents. And, you know, and yes. Effort. And a lot of times when bigger companies lay off people, it's more because of factors of of expenses and, and I'm thinking if you can actually have more employees and have better quality service so but you move to a model like this. Yep. But if it's sort of like someone at home there is still an expense. So say you've got someone in their home office there are still expenses associated with that. Who's going to pay for the computer? Is it all going to be ergonomically designed, health and safety? Um, who's going to pay for the power, etc., etc.? So there are still some costs. And, and from the social aspect, we are social animals. And so we can become quite um, disassociated from the organisation. We don't feel the same sort of loyalty if we're not actually there meeting the people. If you think about it, you go to work and it's the people that you interact with that you enjoy. Uh, and it's often the people that keep you there. It's also sometimes the people who send you away. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, oh, I don't want to leave. I really love my team. Whereas if you're sitting on your own in an office, networking in, so going on Skype or whatever it is, but you won't have that connection. So I think employers will find there's more cost associated because turnover will be high. There won't be as much loyalty. Having said that, technology may change that too with augmented reality and um, yeah. uh, virtual reality. If people can gain the similar experience uh, sitting at home, but as if they are actually right beside someone being able to do this, that social <laughs> aspect, then that may, that there, there could be some significant changes then. So it may not be right now, but uh, because at the moment virtual reality, a lot of it's pretty okay. clunky. But, um, but in the future, that could yeah. change significantly. Mm. I mean, we might live in all our, in our little virtual worlds, yes. Uh, I'm just thinking of like holograms. And yeah. Yes, that sort yeah. of stuff, yeah. yeah like that. I, I think some of the, I'm not sure what happened to Donald Trump, but someone, some politician there, he actually couldn't attend, physically be there at the venue. He just appeared there on stage. Jacinda there was some Ardern. speech, yeah, yeah, just recently. Yeah, Jacinda Ardern is launching Tech Week next week, but it's, it's a hologram of Jacinda Ardern, not herself. So, yeah, yeah, the future is here. I think, <laughs> I think it was in France during the presidential election. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions? That was a really good one. <laughs> okay, we've kept you slightly over, sorry. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for your time.